process at the same time. Um, I echo all of the advice that she's given you. And I really think, hope that you take it to heart, especially the advice about doing internships. My gosh, I can't tell you how many things in life I learned that I absolutely despised before it was too late um, and I was stuck in a career path. Um, and that it can happen that you get stuck for a little while and it takes you a while to get out of that into the next thing. And um, if you can save yourself that time by learning during a no, no strings attached internship, it's a great thing. Um, for me, I've flown up from Dallas. I am the communications director and the marketing manager for a $1.4 billion architecture, construction, and technology firm. And what I think is interesting, and of course, since this is me speaking, I think it's fascinating um, how I got to that point, right? I started out as a student here, just like you guys did. Um, and so how did that journey happen? I also meandered a little bit, but when I sat and looked at how did I move from point A to point B to where I am? So I want to talk to you about those things. And then at the end of our time together, I want to give you three things that I think you need to write down, tattoo on your heart for career success long term, regardless of what you do. I'm just really passionate about that. And to a certain extent, I also want to advocate for the industry that I work in because a lot of communication managers or communication majors don't know what my firm does. They don't know anything about our industry, and I specifically hire only communication graduates because this degree prepares you like no other, and we're a fast-growing industry, and it's one that um, you want to look at. So I want to advocate a little bit for what we do. So um, the things that I think that you need to know about how you move from point A to point B, I've learned a lot in life. Success is defined by thinking about others rather than thinking about yourself. Um, when you learn to look outside yourself and think about the stories of others, your story comes into clarity as well. And you're helping them be successful. And that's a very important part of how I moved from being a student, how I behaved as a student, to how I behave as a professional in the working world. Secondly, I want to encourage you, Dana mentioned this, don't be afraid of taking a risk. I am not a risk taker by nature, but I am a risk embracer. And I want you all to think about that. Embrace risk. 75% of the time, I'm like, I don't know if this will work out, but I feel pretty good about it. I'm going to make the decision then, because if I wait for everything to come into alignment, I'm never going to make a change, and I am going to be stuck, and I'm going to be depressed, and I'm going to wonder, oh my gosh, I'm 40-something years old, and I can't make a change because I'm scared. Okay? So I've felt that way all along. So here's the story of how I got from here to there. Um, I'm going to wander because that's how I am, and I don't have slides, so I can't, OK? Um, <laughs> I started out here and uh, got my undergraduate degree in 1993. Didn't know what I wanted to do. How many people in this room are still not really sure what they want to do? OK, it's OK. I didn't know. I mean, I know that I like people. I like talking to people. I like understanding how people interact. Um, I like people talking about me. I mean, all those things I like. Uh, but I didn't really know what that meant in a career world. And so I decided to go ahead and pursue my master's degree to see if I could refine what I was interested in. Had a great experience if you're looking into a graduate program. Missouri State has a great program in communications. I can't tell you strongly enough how it's one of the top programs. And I am grateful every day for the experience I have as a graduate student here. I took my um, master's focus, which was on intercultural communications and small group dynamics, because I really love how people, when they're coming from different backgrounds, regardless of nationality, gender, you name it, how do people get together and make something happen? How does that work? Spent a lot of time looking at that. Gloria helped me through that process. It was great. And I got to the end of it, and I thought, wow, still don't really know what I want to do. <laughs> but I know that I really like this idea of getting people to make decisions and to do it cooperatively, to work collaboratively. How can I learn more about that? 70% risk? Hey, there are organizations that let you work outside your own culture. Let's try working overseas. What's the worst thing that can happen? I have a two-year contract. I hate it. You can do anything for two years. So I did it for two years. I went to Kenya. Best experience of my life until the next best experience came along. But that was the best experience <laughs> of my life, right? I got to teach at a university there. And let me tell you, you think it's difficult. I was in Dana's camp. We were laying out things on these big whiteboards. I was asked to teach, how do you disseminate information in Kenya where there are no mailboxes? How do you get communication amongst groups of people in an oral culture? 
and here I'm coming from an American culture that was far advanced, even not as advanced as it is now, it was a puzzle, and I had to teach it. Talk about thinking on your feet. I also worked with American volunteers who came and did humanitarian projects. It was great, great experience. Hang back. Thought, well, do I want to extend my time there? Do I want to continue doing that? I kind of missed my family, missed building relationships. So I thought, no, I, I think I want to be here. I tried living in Springfield for a month. It was really cold, <laughs> so, kind of like now. I thought, I think I need to move, but I still don't really know what I want to do. But it's a little clearer now. For me, I really like telling the story. I really like working with people where it's a puzzle and I need to figure it out. So I started thinking about companies that did that kind of thing. Now, you have to understand that when I left for Kenya, O.J. Simpson was being chased on a freeway, okay? <laughs> when I came back from Kenya, along the freeways, which were remarkably clean compared to my experience overseas, there were signs that said www.this, www.that. The internet boom happened while I was overseas. Literally in the course of two years, the way we communicated as a culture changed. The way we looked for jobs changed. It was really difficult. So my takeaway for that for you is don't think that the way things are happening now are the way things are going to happen when you graduate. <laughs> things are going to be different and you need to be flexible. So for me, I thought, I know of these companies that do a good job about talking about people. One company that I looked at that I really loved was Southwest Airlines slammed him with my resume, slammed him with my resume, said, fine, I know what I need to do. I need to live in the same town that a company that I really like is at. So I packed up and I moved to Dallas. Didn't have a job. 70% <laughs> chance of likelihood that I'd make it, though. There are lots of jobs in Dallas because, you know, Southwest isn't the only company there. In fact, it's, one, it's the fourth largest growing metro area and has been for the last 20 years. Dallas is a really great place to be, so go ahead and move down. It's warm. <laughs> so I moved down. I had friends to stay with. So my odds of success were good enough to take that risk. Don't be afraid of taking a risk. Move where the opportunity is. That opportunity may be on the other side of Springfield. That opportunity may be on the other side of the United States or maybe on the other side of the world. Think big and take the risk when the risk is there. I moved down, didn't get a job in Southwest. And here's where I learned something very important that all new graduates should know if you haven't been advised by your career advisors. There are these people called recruiters, and they're very helpful <laughs> because they give you access. Um, another thing that you may not be aware of, although I think Missouri State's doing a much better job of communicating this, is that the Missouri State University Alum Network is really very vast. Um, there are several of us in Dallas, and I made time to call the three people <laughs> <laughs> that I knew through the communications department that lived in Dallas and didn't ask them to give me a job, didn't ask them to make a job, didn't ask them to refer me to a job. I said, can I have 30 minutes of your time? Because I just really want to learn what it is that you do and how you got to do what you did. So use a recruiter to help you find access because they have opportunities that aren't even out on the street and they can get you in the door. And to use your network and use it gracefully remember it's about that people like me it's not just me like to talk about themselves and they want to help you they want to help you be successful and our network as a loves helps us out a lot and people talk about well you know people like to hire people that went to their school it's not just that it's I know your cultural values I know the professors you had I want the best for you too so rely on those folks so that's what I did worked my network finally ended up landing a job about a month and a half after I got there at an accounting firm. Very useful lesson for me. First, I was introduced to the world of professional services marketing. Great industry as a whole. I'll talk about that in a second. Second, I learned that I hated working for accountants. Me personally <laughs> despised them because they didn't want to spend, the firm I was with didn't ever want to spend money. And I didn't understand how to build a platform and, and get them to agree with me. So it was a difficult experience for me. I would do it again if I could because I learned a lot of valuable lessons that my husband got married. I would do it again just for that. But <laughs> I learned a lot about what it was like to market professional services. Now, does anybody know what professional services means? Okay, accounting, architecture, construction, legal services, Healthcare. 
It's anything where you're selling a service. Most of those people are licensed, um, and so you're not really selling a thing. You're selling an idea of a thing, a promise of something that can be delivered without actually having it in your hand. And one thing that I experienced when I went through school was I thought marketing was kind of something to be, you know? Marketing is something that the business college talks about. They talk about a widget, pushing the widget, and producing the widget, and turning your inventory. So who wanted to be in marketing, right? Professional services, that's not what it is. Marketing and professional services is selling this idea. I just met with my client this morning at Detour, because detours we know are valuable. I met with my client over at Cox Health Center. You may have noticed if you've driven out on national, the big tower crates there. That's my firm. We're designing a new patient tower, and we're building it, too. Uh, very unusual that those are all integrated in the same company, but we do that. And our client is tough, and so I wanted to make some time while I was here to get to know him. If I know him, then I know a little bit more about how we can tell his story. And by telling his story, then I tell my story, too. So it's win-win, right? We had to convince him to hire our firm, and all we had to say was that we can do this we can do this project for you. We can design a bed tower. We can build a bed tower. So give us $130 million. That was easy, right? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. No one is going to give you $130 million to do that kind of project on the promise that you just are pretty nice guys. So professional services marketing, you're really working on how do we condition our clients? How do we sell an idea, build a trusted relationship with them? How do we convince them that we're experts? And how do we help them succeed? Because when they succeed, we succeed. So that's my detour on advocating for my industry. I really want you to look into what professional services are all about, because it's the number one area that communication majors are needed. I'll tell you why in a little bit. OK, so stayed with that accounting firm for a year. Met my husband, got married, hated the accountants, loved the accountants, married, but didn't like the rest of them. So I moved to a different type of professional services marketing, an architecture firm. And that was where I found my niche. Because architects are really creative people, really passionate, designy, temperamental. You know, they were a great bunch. And they were a, a place that I needed to be. I was there for the next 13 years. And the reason I stayed with them wasn't because they needed a lot of help, although Lord knows they did. I found that I had the opportunity to scope my career. So my piece of advice for you in that is don't look at the job that you enter in as the job that you will stay. And it's a valuable lesson. Um, I was telling my good friend Melinda, who I'm staying with, that in the course of one week last year, I made all four of my employees cry. <laughs> and I felt like a terrible person. But the way I made them cry was I said, what is it that you want to do over the next three years? Because my job is to help you do better. All of them, but we don't know what we want to be when we grow up. So if you're worried about what you want to be, you know, 30 and 40 year olds in the work world sometimes don't know what they want to be. The point is, though, you can be what you want to be. Your job doesn't have to be defined by the job title that you're given. Take on extra responsibility, learn, and grow. My uh, architects hired me to be a jack of all trades. You know, put this brochure together, send this out to a client, do this, do that. Over the course of 13 years, I went from doing that to really helping them gain some pretty notable clients. While I was there, we identified that we wanted to do work for Disney, and so we went and went Disney work, and we built five of the resort hotels. Um, we identified that we were really good at cinema school, so we went and worked for George Lucas. And that took a long time, and I was responsible for all of that. Um, and decided after a while that, like Dana said, it's important to know when to move on. And I was tired of selling work. I wanted to just come up with a strategy and talk about the stories. So two years ago, I took a big risk and went from that 50-person boutique firm to a 550-person eight office national and international uh, architecture, construction, and technology firms. So we do do some widgets, um, but we do a lot of selling of other things. So let me tell you kinds of the things that I do there, just in case you're wondering. When I put on my marketing hat with um, my office, and I have to read this because sometimes it makes me want to cry because I, I think I need to hire an enemy. I have seven people that work for me, um, and I assign all of their workload. So I'm managing what they're doing in their personal growth. I am setting the marketing strategic plan for each of our offices. In, from Mexico to Florida to Texas to Colorado. I'm taking care of all of that. I set our general marketing direction for our firm. 
we look at it, we analyze it, is it a good fit for us, are we a good fit for that client, how are we going to win that job, how are we going to write it, how do we need to rewrite it, what images do we need to do to support our story, how do we QA, QC it, which is quality control, um, and then tracking the results. I coach my teams. Before interviews, I fly out and I spend three days with them and we practice, practice, practice. So if you haven't done the public speaking showcase, you might want to consider that. Um, we do all of our graphic Marcom work. Um, and then I also track all the work that our business developers are doing. I take that hat off 50% of the time and I put on the hat that says Director of Communications, which is awesome. And that's what I really want to do all of the time. So maybe I will hire somebody else. Um, engines, and I am the voice of our company. So that can be really interesting because you have the voice of the company, then you have the voice of the company in Dallas. And this morning I was thinking about what does the voice of the company in Springfield look like? And how do we need to sound? And who do we need to talk to? And how do I coach my individuals to speak to the press? When CBS Evening News called me and said, we really love the work that you did converting a Kmart into a church. Can we feature it on the Evening News and who can we talk to? Well, I'm not going to just say, oh, go call Fred, our CEO. He's down with that, you know. <laughs> I'm going to spend some time with Fred, get Fred ready so he knows what he needs to say. And that's a really fun part of the job. Um, we're writing case studies. We're placing articles. We're doing project awards. You name it. We're doing the website. Please don't go look at my company website because it's terrible and we're relaunching it. I inherited something that was built in Flash six months before the iPhone came out. So you can imagine um, that we don't do any analytics or anything else like that. So it's sad, sad day. So that's what it looks like at any given day. And you can pick your own career path. It's that way in most companies. I think Dana would say that was true in her path too. Part of the reason you're able to meet Ander is because you can pick what you want to do. <coughs> if you remember that it's about the other and it's not about you. It's about helping your coworkers succeed. It's about helping your company succeed. It's about learning what their story is and telling your story in a way that matters. So, I'm also going to be mindful of time and leave you with three things that I think you need to tattoo, seriously, on being successful as a professional. First, keep creativity in mind. And when I say creativity, I'm not talking about go sign up for another graphic design class. <laughs> Although that's helpful. Uh, knowing good design is very, very helpful. Um, creativity is always being willing to think about what's next and being willing to look and learn at new opportunities. Who are you reading outside of the books that you have to read for class? And believe it or not, there is life outside of class. And it's just as hard, maybe even harder when you're in the working world to find that time. So on the plane, I started reading a great book that just came out. Uh, it was a New York Times bestseller before it even was released. Uh, it came out in December called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And if you're into social media and what the next phase of life is, you need to buy that book. I'm telling you the truth. Because it's all about constant engagement, constant engagement, constant engagement, being your competition. And that's what people have a hard time with. So be creative. Think about what the next thing is. Because what we already know and understand and learn in school is updated by the time we're trying to implement that in our own company. Second, curiosity is really, really important. Um, Look at new technology. Look at innovative ways of doing things. Even look at innovative ways of doing things in the team that you join. Important caveat, please don't be that employee that joins the firm and then proceeds to tell your boss everything that needs to change. Because you don't know. <laughs> you don't know why things happen until you live in it for a while. So live in it a while, but be mindful of different ways to do things. Here's a good example. Right now, my company is spending a lot of time thinking about content marketing. And if you're in any kind of communication class right now, I'm sure you're hearing about content marketing. If not, read any industry, publication and PR, everybody will tell you content marketing is the way to do things. I'm tired of people telling you the way to do things. Show me a company that has actually done what they tell me that I should do, and that's the person I because they've lived through it. So what we're trying to figure out is, all right, we know that we need to be consistent in white papers that we put out, in what we're doing in social media, and in PR, and we know we need to track those results, and we know we need to make adjustments based on what clients need. How? How do we do that? And how do we do it effectively? So today, I met with Rod Schaefer. Rod Schaefer says, Shauna, integration is the way to do things. I'm like, I agree. 
people, and I said, Brad, I don't think that it's about integration, by the way, means having architects and construction people in the same room, same firm, doing the same thing together, and they share all the risk. Long and complicated, but that means if one person messes up, everybody pays the penalty. If one person succeeds, everybody's rewarded. And that's not the way the industry works. So he said, that's what the real story is. And, and I want to be part of that story. So my challenge now is to go back to my firm that's a market leader in doing this and say, we have a client who is telling me that he believes in our story and he wants to help us with our story. So how do we capture that to tell other clients? How do we put that on on social media that attracts the attention of other people who are interested in that because they also know that's the way the industry is moving. So I'm curious about it. Here's what Cox Health is doing. How did they do it? What does Rod Schaefer say about that? Who did he use? He used Beck. Where do I find Beck? See the circle? And as soon as I start tracking that and I can respond to that, I have to be pretty curious and start looking. So that means I'm looking outside my industry at things. So stay curious. Third, finally, be consistent. Be consistent. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got in my career was about this very thing from my uncle, of all people, when I came back from Kenya and I was moping, oh, what do I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> where do I want to be? He said, you need to be where you are. Be where you are. So if that means right now you're in an internship, be there. 100% of you needs to be there. If you're taking a seminar class, you know, it meets at 6 p.m. at night, be in the class. Be 100% there. You wouldn't believe how many people roll their lazy you-know-whats into work and give a 60% effort. And it's very frustrating because how, what could we be if you were there? 100% of your thinking, your attitude for your client, for your co-workers, because it's about them and it's not about you. You've been gifted with this great set of skills. So leverage those and just be consistent. Deliver what you promise. Some people say, you know, under-promise, over-deliver, BS. Promise reasonably, deliver reasonably, deliver a little more. That's really what makes a difference. So consistency, creativity, curiosity. You guys have picked really the best time to study communications. We are, in case you haven't noticed all the woes in our economy, we're now a service-based economy. We're not a production-based economy. That means we're selling services more than ever. And that means we have to communicate, collaborate, cooperate more than ever. Companies, by and large, do a terrible job of it and you're being trained with the skill set that's required to help. So, best of luck to each of you.